Good afternoon. My name is Don Tantiplawful, and I'm the Associate Director of Academic Ventures and Engagement at Harvard Radcliffe Institute. It is my distinct honor to welcome you to this exciting lecture and discussion in the Institute's Science Lecture Series, with our current emphasis at the intersection of food sustainability and climate change. At the start, let me acknowledge the members of the Radcliffe Institute Leadership Society and our annual donors tuned in this afternoon. Let me also specifically acknowledge the Mary E. and Clara Z. Costanza Fund for Science, which is supporting this event. Your generosity keeps Radcliffe programming free and open to the public. We thank you. Earlier this academic year, in October of 2023, we held our annual science symposium titled Feeding the Future, Food Sustainability and Climate Change. That symposium explored the dilemma, or seeming dilemma, of addressing the global climate crisis while feeding the world's population healthfully and equitably. I note in passing that a full recording of the symposium is available on the Radcliffe website. That major symposium was a key component of our institute-wide and multidisciplinary climate change initiative, our omnibus comprehensive effort to investigate the causes and consequences of the climate crisis, to develop strategies in adaptation and mitigation, and to address issues of climate justice in thought and action, analytically, normatively, aesthetically, and imaginatively, and sociopolitically. We especially seek to address the effects of the climate crisis on marginalized and vulnerable communities, both locally and globally. At the heart of this work is Radcliffe's commitment to supporting and sharing research that promotes innovative solutions and greater equity. This reflects Radcliffe's bedrock commitment to interdisciplinary study, informed by an equally deep dedication to inclusion. We firmly believe that these approaches will generate valuable new insights into effective and equitable ways of addressing climate change. In January, we held our first installment of this academic year's science lecture series titled Using Evidence and Data to Illuminate Our Food Systems, given by Professor Jessica Fonzo of Columbia University. Professor Fonzo explored and analyzed the global interconnectedness that characterizes our food systems, as well as the data complexities that unfortunately bewilder citizen and policymaker alike. We will build on those rich themes this afternoon. Today's science lecture, titled Climate Change, National Security, and International Cooperation, to be delivered by our featured speaker, Swathi Virovali, brings into focus the Institute's emphasis on addressing climate change from the perspective of concrete action, especially in governmental policy. Climate change poses unprecedented threats to global security. What natural resources are most in danger from the international security tensions accelerated by climate change? How can the United States help to minimize resource conflicts? And how can disparate government agencies and different national governments be moved to address crises of resource scarcity with a spirit of cooperation and consensus? To help guide us, we will learn from Swathi Viravali, Director of Climate Change and Adaptation at the National Security Council in the Executive Office of the President of the United States. Our speaker will be joined in discussion by our moderator, Professor Ido Berger, Faculty Co-Director of the Science Program at Harvard Radcliffe Institute and Professor of Astronomy in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences at Harvard University. On behalf of Swathi Viravali and Ido Berger, I encourage those here to use the Q&A feature on Zoom to submit questions at any time during the program. Please keep your questions concise so that we can explore as many topics as possible. It is now my pleasure to give the virtual floor to Swathi Viravali. Thank you so much, Don. Um, I really appreciate it. Good morning. Actually, I think it's good afternoon. We just pressed the 
the afternoon threshold. Um, it's really great to be here today. And thank you very much to Harvard Radcliffe um, Institute for the invitation. It's my distinct honor and pleasure. I was, as, as Don stated, I was here, asked to um, be here today to speak about the intersection of climate change, national security, and international cooperation, which is what I hope to do. I'd like to begin by quoting our president, who emphatically states, and you've heard him stating, that the world is at an inflection point, and point due to the intersection of challenges as well as unprecedented opportunities. And because of this, the United States, in conjunction with our partners and allies, need to seize this decisive decade in order to tackle these shared challenges. We know that changes in weather patterns, ecosystems, and climate all have tangible human impacts that directly affect national security, and that short, medium, and long-term changes in the global environment are going to be compounded by more frequent extreme events that then create multiple stressors. Climate risks on security and stability will transform strategic relationships between competitors, adversaries, and partners. So in that vein, international cooperation is necessary not only to confront the security and stability challenges of this magnitude, but also to advance U.S. strategic priorities as it offers a pathway to engage with like-minded partners as well as develop new partnerships. This is essential because climate change by its very nature creates a polycrisis, which are crises that occur when multiple global systems become ca casually entangled in ways that significantly degrade humanity or humanity's prospects. These interacting crises produce harms greater than the sum of those crises that would produce in isolation, were their host systems not so deeply interconnected. Polycrises, by their very nature, requires cooperation on fo focused and targeted interventions that can have global and net positive impacts. To address this, and as outlined in our national security strategy, the United States is attempting to harness the most, the best and most productive outcomes of the strategic competition and effective cooperation. The result, in effect, is an effort to build mutually assured resilience, where by working together with partners, we'll enhance our respective and collective capacity and capabilities. In this manner, we assure each other's resilience to the threats that we are facing from a changing climate. Next slide, please. Thank you. So how are we doing this? Under President Biden's leadership and this administration, the US government is working to implement a number of initiatives to improve the adaptive capacity of vulnerable communities, both at home and abroad, to adapt to and manage the increasing impacts of climate change across the globe. The U.S. has leveraged domestic action to rally global ambition and build global resilience. This slide is just a small sampling of both the depth and breadth of initiatives and actions that the Biden administration is taking to tackle the climate crisis. For example, at COP28 this year, we galvanized other countries to commit for the first time to transition away from fossil fuels, stop building new unabated coal capacity globally, and triple renewable capacity and double global energy efficiency by 2030, as well as triple nuclear energy by globally by 2050. We have also sought to advance the U.S. plan to conserve global forests, including by becoming a world leader in innovative debt for nature swaps that have helped countries restructure over $2 billion in debt to unlock hundreds of millions of new financing for both nature and climate. But more needs to be done. In 2023, there were 28 confirmed weather climate disaster events with losses that exceed over $92.9 billion just in the United States. In 2022, weather climate disasters caused over $223.8 billion in losses globally. These are sobering numbers. Reducing these impacts and losses occurs only through more effective and transformative adaptation and achieves climate resilience, and both can only be achieved through international cooperation. While global adaptation finance has reached an all-time high of $63 billion in 2023, growing 28% from 2020, this still falls far short of the estimated needs of $212 billion by year 2030 for developing countries alone. In 2021, President Biden launched his emergency plan for adaptation and resilience, also known as PREPARE, to address these core issues. Through PREPARE, we are improving the adaptive capacity of over 500 million people across the world by enhancing the access to and development of, as well as delivery of climate services, mainstreaming and integrating adaptation and resilience into plans and programs, and mobilizing finance and private capital to support adaptation. 
We know that effective, inclusive investments in climate adaptation can minimize the impacts of climate change, and in some cases, even prevent them. Every dollar invested in climate adaptation yields between two to $10 in economic benefits. These benefits avoid losses in lives and livelihoods, as well as lowers financial costs and creates meaningful jobs and contributes, contributes to greater security and stability. It also strengthens the capacity to protect hard-won developmental gains from being eroded by storms, droughts, rising sea levels, and other climate impacts. This type of climate resilient development could reduce the number of people in, um, in need of international humanitarian assistance annually due to climate related disasters as low as 68 million by 2030 and even drop further to 10 million by 2050, excuse me, a decrease of over 90% compared to 2021. At home as well, the United States has recently launched the National Climate Resilience Framework. This is a framework that's intended to ensure that our administration's investments will build more climate resilient communities across and within the United States. The, the National Climate Resilience Framework focuses on communities becoming more resilient through diverse economies, food security, as well as water security, and have access to services such as equitable transportation so that they can themselves become more resilient to climate threats. If we could go to the next slide, please. Thank you. We know that preparedness pays. We also know that these investments and policies are only truly successful if they catalyze action by our partners and our allies as well. Ultimately, our goal is a res strong, resilient, and leading edge technology industry base that the U US and, and its like-minded partners established and emerging economies alike can invest in and rely, and rely upon together. If that is indeed our goal, we, as we tackle the climate crisis with our partners, we see that enhanced resilience coupled with the stability of nations in the face of a changing climate is at the very heart of how we should be defining climate security. This is not so much as a pivot as it is an expansion of how we've been approaching the security implications of climate change. Without immediate action during this cru crucial decisive decade, global temperatures will cross the critical warming thresholds of 1.5 degrees Celsius, after which scientists have warned that some of the most catastrophic climate impacts could come into fruition. Even if all nations implemented their announced mitigation pledges with emissions peaking in the mid 2020s, climate change will impact many facets of human life and every sector of society far into the future. But globally, we still remain in a cycle of crisis response. We have the tools and capabilities to move beyond the state. There are a great many ideas, but here are some for consideration as we think about how to facilitate the resilience of communities and the stability of nations. As we've just described, the impacts of long-term climate change continue to rise, so investments and adaptation will have outsized benefits. Effective, inclusive investments in climate adaptation can minimize the impacts of climate change and in some cases even prevent them. Every dollar invested in climate adaptation yields between two to $10 in economic benefits. These benefits help avoid losses in lives and livelihoods as well as lower financial costs, create meaningful jobs and contribute to greater security and stability and strengthen the capacity again to protect these developmental gains that we talked about before. For adaptation to decadal climate change, investments in protection and protective infrastructure and improved climate smart agriculture and um, can yield a five times higher return on investment and provide prevent food loss. Additionally, studies have shown that a dollar invested in resilient food systems can save up to $3 in acute crisis response funding. Provisional U.S. government calculations find that early interventions, for example, in Southern Africa, can alleviate the anticipated El Nino-driven crop losses, and we'll get to El Nino in just a second, at the start of a growing season, just such as the use of heat-tolerant seeds has up to 70% higher return than interventions made after the harvest, uh, after our harvest, such as food aid. Those are indeed sobering numbers. Next slide, please. The second point for your consideration is that we have to integrate climate security into our foreign and national security policy making. I'd like to think that there's consensus on that. What we need more assistance is, is on the how. The first pillar of our proposed approach will be to prioritize specific regions and sectors that are particularly vulnerable to climate impacts. 
The US and our partners need a framework that prioritizes not that not only prioritizes rather climate challenges, but also identifies its solutions. By disaggregating impacts of global consequence from regions that are susceptible to a variety of climate impacts that will undermine regional security and stability to finally building resilience and response in the most vulnerable nations. By using climate security as a lens, we are able to identify targeted and international solutions that can address these climate-induced problems. Working with partners to create this mutual, mutual resilience, it will become imperative to deploy our scientific development and diplomatic resources, and when needed, defense in a strategic matter. The second pillar on the screen in front of you is that we have to institutionalize climate security across the federal government and with our partners. It's not enough to have climate security professionals. We must ensure that career civil servants as well as civil society and all our partners consider how climate impacts their mission. It's only by embedding climate into the core DNA and hearts of these institutions will we become successful in dealing with changing climate regimes in ways that not only absorb the threats and stress, but simultaneously creates resilience by improving the structure and function of governance. Finally, it is imperative that we're able to operationalize climate security by turning the abstract into observable and me measurable phenomena. And I'd like to spend a couple of minutes talking about why this last point is particularly important. If we could go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Within, within the executive office of the president, we are using El Nino as a case in point on how and why Firstly, preparedness pays, and secondly, why we need to integrate climate security into national security considerations. Starting in summer 2023, scientists began to warn that the 2023-2024 uh, season could bring a particularly strong El Nino with adverse, with potentially adverse macroeconomic, climate and food security, and human impacts within the U.S. as well as across several critical and vulnerable countries. El Nino is a naturally occurring global climatic phenomenon that brings high temperatures to the equatorial Pacific oceans every three to seven years. This large release of heat, which typically peaks in December, enters into the atmosphere and causes most of the tropics to simultaneously experience higher temperatures for the following six months. El Nino also causes drought conditions in some parts of the tropics and flood conditions in others. Unlike isolated weather event events, El Nino is a correlated shock affecting almost half the planet's population at the same time. This can amplify climate-related risks across the tropics as well as the globe due to these teleconnections. The U.S.'s National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, is currently monitoring a major 2023-2024 El Nino event, and that's the one that we're in right now, that they, uh, that they say may rank among the, among the top five largest since 1950, which was when we began monitoring El Nino. NOAA's forecasting temperature and precipitation changes across the planet over the next six months consistent with the expected and unexpected El Nino's local weather effects. Published research shows that the temperature and rainfall effects from an El Nino of this magnitude could globally lead to 7% lower grain output and 2% lower GDP growth over the coming years in tropical countries. Research has also linked historical El Nino events of this magnitude with a 50% increase in the likelihood of civil conflicts and outbreaks over the following year and an increase in militarized fishing disputes which research suggests are four times more likely in the East and South China Seas. And if we know that ENSO is a repeatable and forecastable phenomenon, what are we doing with that information? If we apply a climate security lens, we must be able to address to and mitigate El Nino's myriad impacts. Are we using tabletop exercises, for example, to forecast where the worst impacts will be? How are we using war games to understand and prioritize the key sectors and communities that are most impacted and have huge global and regional consequence? Next slide, please. While I seem to be asking more questions than answers, I do hope some of these points have stimulated some food for thought. I know what we're talking about here today is not easy to do, and nor can it be achieved overnight. But to Don's earlier point, it has to be achieved in conjunction with our partners. 
But if we build a three-pronged approach by prioritizing, institutionalizing, and operationalizing, we can effectively address some of these constraints that you'll see listed on the slide in front of you. Next slide, please. I'd like to do just a quick note on research gaps. I am by no means a climate scientist, but I do hope my favorite climate scientist, Dr. Sarah Kapnick, is on. Um, there are still some gaps on the science forecast and projection side. I won't go into too much detail here, except to say that we need to be more comfortable in dealing with risk and uncertainty, which is a tool and, te and technique that I think we can learn from our Department of Defense colleagues. This is why tabletop exercises and scenario planning and war games are all particularly useful and tools that the DOD uses on a daily basis to deal with the risk that they deal with. While we may not know with extreme precision when and where climate impacts will occur, we can certainly anticipate what, where those impacts will hit the most vulnerable. Again, and be, becoming un, uncomfortable with uncertainty doesn't mean that we, don't, we are not unable to deal with risk. So within, within the Biden administration, we're asking ourselves this very question. How are we making better decisions? How are we anticipating the consequences and local and regional and global impacts of these meteorological and climatological shifts? Can we forecast the probability of these occurrences? If so, then can we incorporate climate into actionable decision-making? Our forecasting and science projections are getting much better. But how do we expect our national security decision makers and policymakers to utilize this information? We must be able to give them products and tools and the capability to assess how climate will affect national security. I'm drawing to the end of my time with you all, and I know that Dr. Berger has some great questions lined up. So perhaps we'll turn to that shortly. Um, and I look forward to engaging with you during the question and answer session. I'd like to leave you with a couple of final thoughts from my perspective before I, I turn it over to Dr. Berger. Ultimately, the agility of governance to incorporate climate into actionable decision-making is contingent upon, larger upon the larger geostrategic context, and also the ability to demonstrate why investing in climate security now will have a huge return on investment, um, particularly on the administration's clean energies commitments, as well as other priorities, but also why longer term investments in the development and humanitarian assistance that have a climate lens are particularly important. The stability of nations and resilience of communities because of a changing climate won't be solved today, but we can certainly start the journey. Our efforts will shape the world we leave for future generations, an, inherit an inheritance that will be measured not only in economic prosperity, but in the health and the resilience of our planet, as well as the multiple dividends of peace, security, and stability that we can reap together. Our efforts cannot stop at our own borders. With that, I will pause and turn it over to Dr. Berger. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Swathi, for, for the enlightening presentation on such a critical topic. Um, I would now like to follow up um, on the presentation with some uh, questions that I've prepared in advance, um, as well as questions that have been coming in uh, from our online audience. And I'll try to um, summarize these questions, interweave them uh, with my own so that uh, we, can keep, uh, we can keep things flowing and try to address all of them. Um, so Swati, I wanted to um, start by asking about uh, a point that you made towards the end of your presentation, which is the interplay between uh, climate change and other geopolitical conflicts um, and how these might exacerbate each other. So as, as we've seen recently, um, wars and conflicts um, have compounding effects on issues like uh, food and water access, uh, on energy supplies, on global transportation. Uh, and so my question is, what, what are your views on how climate change factors into such conflicts, uh, how it may exacerbate them in the future, and um, how are various adaptation and mitigation efforts uh, that are ongoing um, may be adversely impacted by such regional conflicts? Swati, I think you are uh, muted. Wouldn't be a Zoom call if I didn't accidentally unmute or mute myself. Um, so that's out of the way now. Thanks. Okay, that was a great question. Was what I was trying to say. I think there's been um, a lot of reporting as well as empirical research on the direct and indirect relationship that climate will have on resource scarcity. Um, Dr. Marcus King has done some fantastic work um, looking at the effect of water, for example, on on the security and stability within regions. 
But I want to remind us that while the spatiotemporal experiences on the ground will vary, what happens in Iraq or what happens in the Sahel or what happens in uh, Mississippi um, will change. Um, but that's why our my comment earlier is particularly salient in that preparedness pays. If all of these communities begin to invest in adaptation and, and resilience, then I think that's what we are able to do um, more climate resilience um, in, within that community, but also has a broader multiplying effect across the regions. And But we really need to ensure that the necessary and accompanying governance architecture are present in those countries and communities in order to enable, um, in order to enable that pro the proliferation of adaptation and investment in climate resilience. Thank you. Um, uh, thinking about resources um, and access to resources, um, I, I suspect that uh, clean drinking water and access to to food is is likely top of mind for in terms of of um, developing policies. And so I was wondering if you can tell us a bit about ongoing U.S. government efforts to enable access to food, clean clean water, and food globally in the face of climate change. And what are some successes on on this front? Thank you. Um, so I'm, I'm a self-professed water nerd. So I, obviously I think water is at the fundamental of import of everything that we do in society. Um, but the Biden administration has recognized and recognizes the critical role of sustainable water systems, as well as the transformational power that water has across every uh, life of every person on this earth. From its most basic role as a source of life in advanced um, to its role in advancing and powering local economies, water matters. But I think something that we've tried to harp, um, well, tried to reemphasize is its ubiquity in everyday life sometimes leads us to take it for granted. Um, and so while global trends in population growth and urbanization, environmental degradation and climate all pose global challenges to water security across the world, this is why the Biden administration wrote the White House Water Action Plan to accompany our global water strategy. This is also why particularly investments in programs such as Feed the Future, um, which I think um, Don referred to earlier, as well as the famine early warning systems are particularly important. But I do want to underscore that it's not just simply enough to have these programs and interventions. It's really important that communities are able to take advantage and leverage of the information that's yielded by these programs and initiatives. So it, it's really, um, so while it's on one hand, really important to forecast when and where crises are gonna occur because of resource scarcity, it's just as important that communities have the capacity to ingest that information and utilize them appropriately. Again, so you get that grass tops approach to developing climate resiliency, which is something that we're doing through PREPARE, I mentioned earlier, um, and our focus on developing climate in services across um, across the nation. Um, you you. Um, discuss this this point, and you've used the term uh, polycrisis, and and the 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 sense that um, a lot of the work in this area of, of climate change requires global cooperation, um, and has global impacts. Um, at the same time, individual countries are taking various local um, as well as uh, their own steps internationally. And so, I was wondering if you can shed light on how U.S. policies and actions compare to those of other, uh, you know, G7 nations or other global actors. Yeah, and this is a comment I made earlier um, in that, the, you know, the U.S. has to work in concert with our with our allies, um, and in doing so, we have to raise the global ambition to tackle the climate crisis through mitigation as well as adaptation. And the U.S. is working particularly closely on the bilateral front with several countries, um, as well as on the multilateral front to with our partners and allies to ensure that we adopt a concerted approach to tackling the climate crisis. Um, and so some examples of these are through on the clean energy front. Um, we have the Clean Energy Supply Chain Collaborative, which is a huge initiative that we're focusing on with multiple countries through our food security efforts, um, such as the Black Sea Grain Initiative, which was a big lesson learned that we um, from a previous drought that had occurred in the Ukraine in 2014, um, and really am, am, am absorbing some of those lessons and ensuring that we, we don't have another wheat crisis on our hands. So the Black Sea Grain Initiative that we're working with our European allies would be another example, as well as working with NATO. So bu building on this, um, you know, climate change is a global pro problem. It affects essentially every every location on Earth. Uh, but oftentimes addressing and, and coming up with mitigation strategies requires local buy-in and local solutions. 
Um, and those are subject to individual countries, economic realities, political realities. Um, and, and this is also a question that has come up from the audience. Um, for example, even in the US, um, it's not like we've had a uniform set of policies and actions over the past decade. And um, you know, with changing administrations, uh, the, the political and economic realities change as well. Um, so as, as someone who is engaged on, on the policy side of things, what do you see as the most effective way to work with or mitigate against these changing economic and political realities to you know, continue, continue pushing forward on this important topic? Yeah, I think that's such a great question. Thank you for asking it. I think climate and subsequently water and food are some of the few global challenges that I that we have absolute unity on. I think everybody wants to minimize the security impacts of water and the security impacts of food, not only within those communities, but across regions, because we know that these, these sectors in particular have global consequence. Um, and if you look at, for example, the scientific collaboration through the IPCC process, we have international scientists collaborating together on, you know, identifying what those um, forecasts and projections are going to be so that the world can adjust our behavior accordingly. We also have actors like NATO and the Department of Defense trying to minimize our own carbon footprint. Um, I, you know, a quick vignette here before my current role, I was at, at US AFRICOM and one of the few things that often got partners um, in the room, civil military partners in the room was collaborating on climate. And I think it's climate and water are some of those a few bipartisan issues, again, that people feel that the risks are too big to ignore. And so the only way that we can deal with them is working in concert together. Um, and, and related to this, this is a question um, that, that has come in from our audience. Um, in, in terms of the, the Biden administration or U.S. administration in general helping um, uh, countries, especially in the global south, identify um, uh, projects or actions that might be useful in, in the face of perhaps not having enough data on the ground, um, you know, what, what are kind of um, actions that have been taken in that um, in that regard, you know, and enabling projects, uh, not just that are led by the US, but that are going to be led by, by, by local uh, authorities in other countries. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the UN has something called um, early warnings for all, in which we're, they're trying to create a proliferation of early warning systems. And um, again, I think my earlier point is that it's not important. It's, it's not it's just as important to have these systems as it is for communities to be able to use them. So the US through our prepare program are working to ensure that communities are adequately able to ingest that data and information that's coming into them and, and then some and subsequently have some sort of decision making paradigm that comes out of that. And, and so I think the early warning systems for all is such a great example of that. Something else that we're doing um, multilaterally is on climate information services through the Quad Initiative, which is a partnership between the U.S., Australia, um, J Japan, and uh, India. Um, and we're using that science to science collaboration to have scientists produce, you know, the information and again, linking it back to the communities in which they live in to ensure that people have the data to create that sort of like actionable decision making. So I want to return to the uh, uh, issue of resources, uh, but this time not in the context of water and food, uh, but but other types of, of uh, resources. And one of the recent issues that um, have emerged in the space of resource management and climate change is access to, for example, uh, rare earth metals for high tech and alternative energy manufacturing. Um, how do you see the global competition for these rare resources interplaying with cooperative efforts to mitigate climate change? Yes, um, there is absolutely not an easy answer to that very complex question, but I will say that I think efforts to reduce our carbon footprint and other aspects of climate mitigation adaptation policy should not inadvertently create or exacerbate, to your point, um, you know, um, existing conflicts or create new ones. So, for example, over 16% of the world's land-based critical minerals, mines, and deposits and districts are located in areas of extremely high or uh, high or extremely high water stress. And so, so we don't want to, we, we want to minimize that impact to communities in, 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 the, in the search for such, such minerals. Climate change is also opening up new frontiers and in, in, in potential geopolitical tensions um, or cooperation, um, which is the theme of our talk today, 
for example, in the Arctic um, on the discovery and use of critical minerals. Diminishing sea ice, we know, has exposed new shipping routes and created new points of access for oil, gas, and fishing, but it conversely re represents risks for displacement of local communities. It has also potentially un unveiled new deposits of high demand minerals. And so, but what I'm, the point that I'm trying to make here is that enabling our clean energy future should not come at the cost of conflict or stress upon global communities. The U.S., in concert with our partners, will focus on strengthening and creating programming for local efforts that build that take conflict sensitivity into consideration and involvement of local communities. Um, we have long identified the low, the global market for rare earth minerals as as. To, in concentration in one country to be a particular security vulnerability, which is why you see the United States, again, in concert through our with other allies using our DPA Title III initiatives to put large resources towards restarting rare earth production in the United States, for example. So you mentioned uh, you mentioned the Arctic as 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 one region, and there is a, a question uh, that has come in from from uh, several questions, in fact, from the audience about kind of specific, uh, particularly strategic or impactful areas. Um, and so uh, one of these questions, for example, talks about um, what are some U.S. efforts related to deforestation in the Amazon uh, forest. And and so my question is. Uh, take, taking taking this input from the audience, um, what are other air, specific areas around the world where there is a particular focus on it from a strategic perspective in terms of of climate change efforts? On on forests or other in in the Amazon, you mentioned the Arctic. Are there any other regions that are particularly um, you think are particularly impactful to for for U.S. Uh, policy? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that it, that's a great question. And, and if I can just be glib for a second, I would say globally, every you know, there's no region that's not of of import, really. Um, but we know that different regions matter at different sectors in time. For example, um, you know, to your point about the, the Amazon and deforestation there, the, you know, there's a lot of deforestation that's going on in the Congo as well. And so ensuring, again, a, cons a concerted approach to tackling our for deep global commodity-driven deforestation with enabling the clean energy transition in certain countries um, and you know is it moving markets to the US where we we sometimes have the we're able to ingest conflict sensitivity um, a little bit more and minimize the impact of of mining for example on 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 fence line communities I think those are all great examples um, so I want to ask a question about the, uh, the U.S. military in particular. Uh, so the, the U.S. military is responsible for roughly um, 50 million tons of CO2 emission by estimates from the Department of Defense, um, although it seems that that number has been dropping uh, the last couple of years. Um, and, and that's in part, I think, because uh, the Department of Defense seems to be taking the issue of climate change very seriously, um, elevating it to, to a national security priority. Um, and that has to do, I guess, with with risks to facilities, um, energy use, and impact on the mission of the military around the world. Um, from from your perspective, what are some efforts that have been undertaken on the on the military Department of Defense side that are heading in the right direction, and what lessons can be drawn from those efforts that can be brought into the, the civilian sphere? Yeah, thank you. Um, so having worked for the Department of Defense, I, I, I truly think that the DOD is, is leading the um, leading the field in terms of developing concerted climate security approaches. Um, and, and to an earlier point that I made, I think it's because the DOD and I think global security institutions are used to dealing with risk. And so it's kind of, and climate in this sense is sort of risk agnostic. It's just another threat that they have to ingest. So I, I think, for example, our US um, Agency for International Development should use some of the scenario planning and tabletop exercises um, and activities that the DOD has to, again, to forecast how their strategic and operational readiness are going to be impacted. And so if we can get USAID and other development agencies globally to start taking those considerations and use some such tools at their uh, sort of, uh, and have that in their, um, in, in their toolbox, then I think that we'll start embedding um, climate security into the heart of and DNA of the institutions that I talked about earlier. Um, another, another important question from, from the audience, and it relates to what Don mentioned is, is kind of part of the mission of, of Harvard Radcliffe Institute when, when it comes to climate change uh, in particular, but not, not just is, um, 
can you address how uh, incorporating uh, marginalized communities um, uh, in ensuring that you know this this transition and mitigation and adaptation efforts are are successful? How how is that happening in terms of from a policy perspective? Yeah, no, that's a great question, and um, it's so important that the Biden administration created an, an entire office for environmental justice. And so, I cannot do do you know I I don't I I don't want to sort of they do a lot of work, um, and I can't speak to the depth and breadth of of what they do. But I think it's because of that question that that was asked by one of our um, our our. our participants here, that the Biden administration created an office to deal with that, um, to minimize the impact of any type of clean energy transition or, you know, for example, tackling the plastic crisis and minimizing the impact upon communities is, is really important. And how, how do we do that? And um, I think a great example of that is, is to increase the agency of communities or leveraging and incorporating um, indigenous knowledge into areas that, for example, how are particularly water stressed. And so it's it's and, and to your earlier question, um, Ido, from you know, how do we do this from a cooperative perspective? I think the while the climate crisis is painted as a crisis, it's also an opportunity for us to sort of collaborate and, and get these communities who ordinarily would not have talked to each other to then have a platform to, to be sort of at the same level and engage and thereby increasing their own agency and participation in such dialogues. Um, yeah, no, that's a, that's a great point. And um, there are some questions from coming in from the audience also that, that are kind of on the, on the flip side of that, which is, you know, as as these efforts are are going on within within U.S. Uh, government and international cooperation, um, it's kind of looking at the the pressure is pushing back potentially. And so the the question is um, related to lobbying. And if if um, there are specific um, industries that are presenting kind of the greatest challenge or pushback um, on on the attempts to you know re reinvest uh, reinvent uh, industries and and so on. Yeah, it's, it's a great question, and I want to make sure that I answer it correctly. I, I actually think that um, we're not getting a lot of pushback from industry. I think industries realize the importance that climate is going to have upon, for example, supply chains, which is why the administration stood up a new policy council to address supply chain resiliency. Um, and so just like the Department of Defense, where they are used to dealing with risk, but are also risk adverse. I think there's there's things that we can learn from our our, our corporate brethren and tools and tactics that they're they are using to to understand how climate is going to affect their operations again and that that the US federal government should and can and is doing. And so we're developing partnerships with industries, for example, through um, through the, our concept that we talked about earlier on investable adaptation. How do we bring the private sector in to recognizing that they're not just part of the mitigation conversation, um, in, in, you know, from the deployment of clean energy technology, but also on the adaptation side, which is a very unique aspect. And and the I think the the, the narrative, the underlying narrative here is that the preparedness pays, but there's also a macroeconomic benefit to avoided losses. And that's where I think industry is not pushing back because at the end, and at the end of the day, um, you, you know, they, they, they want to minimize loss, economic losses, as do we, we also want to minimize the, in, the impact to vulnerable communities. Mm -hmm. Um, if we if we step back a little bit from the kind of the large scale the the global um, cooperation you know federal government policies and so on um, there are um, questions that I have and also quite a few from the audience where people want to know um, what what can they do or what can communities you know small communities that are driven to action uh, either by kind of local impacts of climate change um, or generally people I think very much care about this topic and and want to feel that they can have an impact. Um, what what kind of policies are there to to help local communities and individuals in in being part of the solution? 
Yeah. So, I mean, I think there's, there's multiple answers to that question. Um, and I think that no action is, is probably the wrong answer. Right. And so any action that any community takes to engage on these very important topics are going to provide that return on investment. Um, so simple advocacy by working with your uh, elected representatives would be a great example of what local communities here can do globally. Uh, engagement um, on different governance mechanisms that and 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 ensuring from a U.S. perspective that the enabling architecture, the policy architecture, exists across communities and globally to enable the proliferation of good adaptation and good mitigation is really what we need to do and work with our partners and allies on. Um, from your, you know, in, I guess. A question to you would be, um, you know, in 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 your work in developing policies, um, um, have you had a chance to kind of interact um, in a in a direct way with representatives, or you know, have a similar position in other governments? Um, and and what do you find as as you know, creative and effective uh, ways of of interacting or or using these these personal connections um, in in developing policies that are going to be effective for for global cooperation um so so the executive branch of of the government works obviously in parallel but not sort of to replace our legislative um what our legislative partners are doing um but what what, what we are doing from a policy perspective is is creating policies that we want that we that we hope that legislators see them see the importance in. So for example, the Inflation Reduction Act, which was in, in, which is sort of a dual pronged approach at, at, uh, at um, addressing economic issues, uh, both within the US and globally, but also addresses our clean energy goals is a great example of, of working with our legislators to ensure that we have buy-in um, and, and develop that concerted approach to tackling the climate crisis. Um. There's another question from the audience regarding um, um, another topic that's that's come up uh, in in science um, lectures at Radcliffe in the past, uh, which is artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the uh, the question relates to you know applying and using artificial intelligence approaches to climate change at the same time that uh, there have been reports recently and even in the New York Times today about increasing energy usage from uh, data centers and companies that are running very intensive computational um, approaches. Um, and so uh, do you have thoughts on that, that interface between you know, AI assisting and also creating its own set of issues on, on yeah. energy? No, uh, it's a great question. Um, technology is great. I'm a poor user of technology as you've seen so far. Um, but I, I think w the point that I'm trying to make here is that we have to ensure that we don't, in, in our goal to create sort of, um, uh, AI access for all, or for example, or, or, or um, um, having access to to technology for all should not should not come with a trade off um, of other things. So to your point on data centers, we have to ensure that when data centers um, are created to set up the you know to facilitate these clouds and other large computational systems, that they're not inadvertently using up vital resources of, of, of that that communities in which they reside depend upon. And so that's why I think using this climate security lens is particularly important because it allows you to see what those trade offs are going to be. Um, and why the earlier point of we can't just have one climate security professional, we need to have the cyber people thinking about how they are impacted by climate. We need to have them talking to the water people who, are, who will be able to project and provide um, hydrological forecasts of, of how much water is going to be absorbed by these centers and ensure a concerted approach within those communities um, so that there's not an adverse effect. And so that's why I think the earlier point of having that, um, that enabling policy architecture to provide that good governance allows all of this to happen and minimizes those trade-offs. And and do you find that in in practice, you know, as as federal policy is being uh, discussed and put together and um, and and moved to the legislative process, um, that at the same time, you know, local state um, authorities are are doing some of their own things. That that there is this kind of back and forth is is effective and and it's it's leading to positive outcomes. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think we should be looking for leaders everywhere. Um, the, the the president um, held the first heat summit earlier this year, and we 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 I think we were um, speaking with mayors from I want to say Texas and California, but it could be wrong, and I apologize if I am. But you know, states that are, have historically experienced an unprecedented heat waves. And so, what are we doing to? What are the good ideas and best practices that the, those states are taking? And how can we leverage that as a federal government? Our U.S. Agency for International Development hopes to mirror that conversation on the international front by having the first ever virtual heat um, summit where we it's a convening dialogue, convening forum to talk about how the impact of global heat is, uh, is having upon global communities, but also not just identifying the problem, looking at how these communities have dealt with you know, what, what are the solutions that they've derived so you can create that community of best practice and infuse um, laterally. Um, there's another question from the audience about the um, uh, specific question of um, impacts of climate change on, on the U.S. national security and uh, wondering if there are specific um, examples of, of things that are going on now or that are areas of specific concern around the world that are related to, to, to this topic of, of how climate change is affecting the U.S. national security interests. Um, well, I'm really hoping I did do a good job of that in in my my talk before, where I was trying to describe the impacts of climate upon U.S. national security. But I'll, I'll go back to an earlier point that I, I made about, for example, supply chain resiliency. Um, I think you know, COVID, um, as as devastating as it was, I think taught us some very important lessons from ensuring that you know when we are streamlining and looking for market efficiencies, again, that we're not inadvertently concentrating resources um, in areas that could be vulnerable to either climactic impacts or other detriments. And so some of the work that I mentioned that we're doing on El Nino, for example, um, is to understand how you, cre you could create global strategic choke points because of um, the supply chain question. So I think the Panama Canal, for example, has been recently in the news because of its impact on global trade, but also also because of how the historic drought that the country has been experiencing in addition to the drought um, that's occurring or precipitation challenges that is occurring through the um, through El Nino. And so are we making sure that we have, um, uh, for example, redundancies built into these, these trading systems so that we can avoid um, and mitigate some secure, national security impacts of these supply chains? A lot of, for example, I think um, health products come from the, the trans-shipping point through the Panama Canal. So that's a huge national security imperative. And so we're bringing this, this climate security lens into some of that existing work, which has not historically existed before. That's great. So I'm going to um, transition, I guess, to the to the final question for, for today. Um, and I was, I wanted to kind of end on a, on a positive forward looking uh, <laughs> lens. Um, and so, you know, in, in, in a lot of um, uh, sci-fi movies or, or novels um, um, and TV shows, you know, I'm, I'm an astronomer, I'm a big fan of Star Trek. Um, we're, we're presented with this future where, where there's this global human cooperation uh, following some sort of a, a large scale crisis and, and you know, humanity emerges from that in a, in a very cooperative uh, mode that, that it really kind of elevates uh, everybody. Um, do you think that the efforts that are focused on climate change mitigation and adaptation and global security could lead us to something like that. If, if we're able to deal with this crisis, do you think that we will emerge with from it with greater global cooperation rather than, than the opposite? Yes, absolutely. I think, and this is a strong point that the president has made and has been reinforced through both domestic and international policy that we've, we've, we've pushed out and that we are much stronger together. There's absolutely no way that the U.S. can do this alone. We have to do this in conjunction with our partners and allies, which is the best approach. Um, but I, I, what I didn't, while I loved, um, what was that movie with Brad Pitt where there's zombies everywhere? Anyway, I, what the mm -hmm. point that I'm trying to make there is that we, we don't need to wait for people to become zombies, right? We don't need to wait for the catastrophe to hit. We should be 
investing in preparedness now so that when, for example, the zombies hit, and I'm being uh, very glib here, um, we have resources to mitigate some of those impacts. So if we could use zombies as an analogy for climate change, you know, we, we don't need to wait for these catastrophes. We don't need to wait for an apocalypse to happen to then have a surge of humanity to say, like, we're all in this together because we should be doing it left of boom, as my military partners would say. That's fantastic. Thank you. Um, and, and you know, hopefully we we are doing it. And it's it sounds like you're, you know, investing a lot of effort and time into, into making sure that we do. So I, I want to thank you, Swati, for joining us today and for the um, illuminating presentation and conversation. Thank you um, so much. So this concludes our, our program today. Um, I wanna thank Swati Viravali again for excellent presentation and for um, answering a lot of the audience questions. And I want to thank our online audience for, for sending in terrific questions. Today's program has been recorded and will be posted on the Radcliffe website in about a week. Uh, we hope you'll join us for future Radcliffe events in the sciences, including um, our upcoming hybrid program Next in Science, the James Webb Space Telescope on Thursday, April 4th. Uh, also, please join us for the third installment of this year's Climate Change Science Lecture uh, series titled Farming the Future, Livestock's Leap to Net Zero, which will take place on Monday, May 6th. Uh, more information about these programs and other programs um, can be found on the Radcliffe website at radcliffe.harvard.edu. Thank you again for joining us today and take care.